So you have to really understand what a laser can do, how it can harm you, how it can how it can interact with the material that you want to work with. Some of these lasers are well, all of these lasers are fairly expensive, so you need to have a good idea of what would what should happen before you even turn the thing on. You also want to make sure that when you turn the laser on, you're not going to go home blind or with holes in places that did not that you didn't leave the house with. And so that kind of work required <laughs> it requires a good understanding of how you know how do your eyes process light. What, what, why are UV photons more powerful than IR photons? Um, why would an ultra fast laser be less, a, a femtosecond laser be, you know, less of an issue, more of an issue than a nanosecond laser? These are just the basics that you have to know. And so, in the work that I do, I do a lot of experimental work and I do a lot of computational work because we might, if you want to change laser wavelengths, you have to buy another you know, quarter million dollar laser. Well, that's dumb. So what you should do instead is have a good understanding of the underlying physics and then create simulations. And all you need are some computers and run the simulations and say, hey, if we get a laser that's at three microns instead of two microns, it will work better. Let's put our money towards this three micron laser instead of this two micron laser. So those are just a few ideas of how I use physics every day at my job. Can I ask a question, Charles, real quick? Because, um, you know, we actually use ultra fast lasers for other obvious um, reasons. Do you actually have a rad safety physicist, Stephen, that's associated with you guys? Because you have to make sure you're protecting your eyes and everything. So I know somebody is running around behind the scenes doing some measurements to make sure you're not, you know, putting yourselves at risk or undue harm. Yes, we actually do have a very annoying person that comes in and makes sure that we are not hurting ourselves and they test all of our goggles. They come in and make sure that the laser is enclosed. They make sure that the interlocks all work. They make sure that, you know, high, high voltage, you're not gonna uh, electrocute yourself because you're standing in a puddle of water next to all these, you know, high voltage devices. I, we have all that stuff and they all just come in and break the interlock just to see if it works. And that's like, oh, so annoying, but they, they're there and they keep you safe. I've been doing laser work since, you know, since 2007, 2008, my, my wife is a very appreciative of everybody who comes in to make sure that I am completely safe and have the same number of holes and then when I leave the house and when I come back. And my eyes work the same way they did when I leave and when I come back. Health physicists are essential, and that's a subspecialty of medical physics, which we all have to take part in if you're a medical physicist. We keep people like Stephen alive. Okay, I'll be quiet. Thank you. I appreciate it. Public service announcement. Uh, all right. So um, thank you, everybody. So some of you have your PhDs. Uh, Abe, you will soon have your PhD. Uh, can you all speak to how having this degree or how getting this degree uh, has impacted your career or how it will impact your career? Um, Abe. So I think uh, for my particular situation, I was studying quantum computing and I wanted to do experiments. And uh, when I started grad school, there were no quantum computers that were accessible instead outside of going to a lab and doing research with one of these computers. So at the time it was necessary for me to do a PhD and that has opened the doors to my current position and building out a team of uh, quantum science communicators who are also doing active research in the field. Um, I will say the technology has advanced rapidly enough that today quantum computers are accessible from the cloud. You can program one sitting here on your laptop. So you don't necessarily need a PhD to access a quantum computer. So if that's your intent, you don't need a PhD. But I do still recommend uh, considering the path because it does allow you to get skills beyond the specific physics that you're studying. You do understand a lot of uh, analytical skills and just generally seeing what it what things look like at the frontiers of science where you don't know all the answers and working collaboratively with others. So I would say getting a PhD is is definitely a useful venture to go down. Awesome. Thank you. So let me make a quick announcement. I see there's a question in the Q&A. Thank you very much for adding the question. Uh, people in the audience, uh, please ask questions in the Q&A and I will, I'm moderating, I'm moderating the session, so I'll ask them of our panelists. Um, okay. Uh, Julianne, could you tell us about how 
you getting your PhD has impacted your career? It's essential for my career. You can't touch a patient without a graduate degree and just call yourself or declare yourself a medical physicist. In fact, the PhD is not alone. You can actually become a medical physicist if you get a master's, but you must be certified and go through a certified residency process. So if you want to follow in my footsteps, if you want to take the white lab coat that I got to hang it into my left, you're going to have to get a graduate degree. At least two to five to seven years of education is minimally required. And then on top of that clinical residency program and then passing a certification exam which will allow you to work in whatever state that um, you decide to reside in and so those are the essential must have steps that you must go through in order to become a medical physicist and work either as an imaging medical physicist that health physicist that I mentioned that helps um, Dr. Roberson from not you know going blind or not being able to go back home to his little kids right and also there's a nuclear uh, medicine medical physicist that you can also become as well. There's many different flavors of us, but we assist in so many different areas. And there's even research physicists that use quantum computing and everything, just like the wonderful Abe over there. So um, you have to have these degrees to follow my path. Awesome. And, and you, Stephen, uh, how so, has your PhD impacted your career? Well, it the thing is with me, I had no idea what exactly I would be doing when I got out of school. If I knew exactly that I would be doing exactly what I'm doing right now, then I might not have gone all the way for a PhD. Um, there are a lot of, I don't know where I am. I'm not sure who else has a PhD besides me, um, which is, that's, that's annoying for a lot of different reasons. Um, <laughs> but, um, I think, so to do my job, there are a lot of people who have bachelor's degrees and master's degrees. Um, but for me, the, the, having a PhD that allowed me to jump from ARL to where I am right now to doing a lot of other things. So for me, the PhD allowed a broadening of opportunities, whereas opposed to if I had stopped with my bachelor's degree or my master's degree, and let's say I went to go work for Ford, you know, if I went to go work for Ford 20 years later, either I would have had to get another degree or I would have to keep working for Ford or keep working on cars because that's my understanding outside of what I learned in an undergrad is only at Ford. So with, um, and I'm not knocking Ford, I like Ford, but I think my graduate degree allowed me to be real broad and answer questions in a real broad way. So when I go to work, and they're like, we're having this problem, we're having this problem. And all their questions are like real focused like this. And when I come in and I start asking questions real broad like that, and I'm like, I never thought of that. I never thought of that. And I'm like, well, huh, why not? As, and I'm not saying it's because you don't have a PhD, but as a PhD, you're taught to just think and to solve a problem, you need to like know a lot about it. Have a, then nail down what you're trying to do to solve that one particular problem. So you could do what I do without a PhD, but you might not do it as well as I do unless you had a PhD. Charles, could I ask Steve a question here? Please, please, yes. So given, uh, so you, you said you didn't know which direction you'd be going right out of the PhD, but given what you know now about the skills that the PhD has given you, if you were to be able to talk to yourself just before applying to the PhD programs, would you tell yourself to keep doing it? Or would you say, mm, maybe you don't need it? No, absolutely. I would say to get the PhD because you never know where your life will take you. I might be working at the job I'm in now for another you know, 30 years and I might be working the job for another you know, year or two. And then somebody would be like, hey, Steven, we have this opportunity It'd be great if you had a doctorate degree, but you don't. So I can't do it. Anyway, you, know, like, you know, when I applied to graduate school, the idea, I didn't, because I didn't know this, that I was able to go to graduate school for free. They had something called a graduate feeder program. And because uh, I went to FAMU and they were like, hey, we want all these smart black people to come to our school. We'll give them free rides to come. It's like, hey, I like free, free education. Sounds good. And they pay you to go. I'm in. So the, the opportunity to get an education for free and do it full time was something that was appealing. And I knew that that opportunity wouldn't come around again. So I was like, all right, I'm going to do this because I know 
whatever I decide to do in the future, a PhD will only help me and won't harm me. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Okay, so I'd like to take the question from the audience. This one's from Thomas Searles. Uh, what's your coolest life experience or person that you've met or job that you've um, completed or project that you completed? Um, that's currently, that wasn't in academia. I think I got that right. So coolest, coolest project that you've worked on, coolest life experience, uh, coolest person that you've met outside of academia. Um, Julianne, could you? That's pretty broad, Dr. Searles. And hey, how you doing? Um, <laughs> I'll just throw that out there. Um, I will say that it has absolutely, well, it's sort of related to work, but it doesn't really have much to do with the topic at hand. But the coolest experience that I got to have was meeting the actual four-star admiral who was actually commanding the team that took out Osama bin Laden. That is Admiral McCraven. If you do not know who this man is, Google him right now. You don't need to be looking at my face or any of our others. This man is a hero, an American hero. And he actually was the chancellor for the entire UT system about three years ago. And so he came onto our campus when we were going through a couple of things and he displayed such amazing leadership. And I got to meet him at our 75th um, um, anniversary party party and I got to get a picture and everything and he is everything that he is like during his CNN interviews and I want you to know when you meet somebody who actually is totally who and what you would believe him to be just on TV and reality completely off the cuff the nicest coolest downest person you ever met that man is that and if you like good leadership somebody who knows how to lead a team that is something that I, I really just got just from um, interactions with this man on campus. And I will tell you that um, there are great people amongst us. And most people got good heart, especially if you get to meet them and have a real one-on-one -on -one interaction. And I'm sort of going back to the question that you mentioned with um, Stephen about what did the PhD um, do for you and everything. And I wanted to ask him, doesn't it give you more options when it comes to managerial positions, leadership positions, and so forth? Because I know definitely when you come into um, things like medicine, academia, there's a hierarchy. And the lower your degree, then you, it limits the expectations for how much you can pro progress and move up. So please be aware if you decide, hey, master's is where I tap out, please understand that different management positions may have a minimum um, degree requirement that supersedes where you've stopped. So really think about how far do you want to grow? Because your 20 years goes quick. I can't believe that I was in school, you know, 20 years ago in college. Lord, I don't look that old. I want you to understand 20 years is going to go by fast. It's going to be 2040 soon. And where will you be? Where will you be? And do you want to limit yourself? Because five to seven, it goes quick. It's quicker than jail time. I'm telling you, you're going to get through this PhD way quicker than you think. And then if you um, decide now not to go that far, imagine the fewer options you have as you get to these crossroads in your life where you get married, you have kids or whatever in any order that you do it. You got to think about the long game, 20, 30 years out. And I know it's hard to think about, but you got to give yourself options. That's so important. Thank you for adding that last point. I'm really, really happy you said this. Um, can someone else tell us about your coolest life experience, person that you've met, or a project that you've done outside of academia? Maybe uh, Abe, do you have any ideas? It's a fun question. No pressure. Yeah, no pressure, especially no pressure. after that. After that response, um, I'll tell you about. Uh, personal victory and also um uh and also something that i think was cool that i did recently and um so let me start with the coolest thing i did recently uh, so as i mentioned quantum computing is a very small field and this summer um, our team rallied to train 5,000 people quantum computing across the world across time zones across just all over the world. And if you look at the world map and see a distribution of where people are coming from in this course that we did, it was from all over the world. And these numbers are 
unprecedented in quantum computing. And the part that makes me really happy is seeing even places like my own home country of Ethiopia, where generally in research, quantum computing in particular tends to be an expensive endeavor, seeing countries involved where it would be very hard to build out a lab in quantum computing being part of the, the active research and the development of quantum computing is something that I consider to be a really cool life experience. It's not exactly academia, but it is bringing effectively the, the access to the technology to as many people as possible around the world. A, I'll tell you a small personal victory as well, which is um, I set a goal for myself to be able to swim um, to swim for a very long distance. And um, recently I was able to do a continuous uh, two kilometer back and forth in a 25 yard pool without stopping. And I think that's a big personal victory for myself. That is incredible. That is incredible. <laughs> I see that uh, Steven's pretty amazing. Steven, Steven is not convinced. Where are you swimming away from? At 25, come on, hey, man, you gotta come get me in this boat. We finna die tonight. I can't swim. I can't. <laughs> um, in terms, yeah, we'd love terms, to hear some some stories from you, Stephen. So, coolest life experience, uh, person you met, job that you've done outside of academia. Uh, all of my jobs have been outside of academia. Um, the coolest stuff I do outside of academia is all classified, so I don't want to talk about it. Um, that's the thing. Uh, look, I'm you, I, all this is being recorded. All the cool stuff we work on. It's classified. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Uh, the uh, the fun, the the best part about what I do that's outside of academia is all the volunteer stuff that I do. The two big volunteer things that I do is the National Society of Black Physicists is one. I've been on the board for NSVP since Renee asked me. Good lord, five years ago I've been in, and NSVP was in a very different place financially. Uh, as an organization, when we took, when I, when Renee was on was the president, and we have really turned it around uh, through a lot of hard work, lot and lot of hours, lot of donations, a lot of faith, a lot of work. That to me, outside of you know being married and the work that I do, is the thing that I'm most proud of. Um, I meet so many. I met Julie there. I met Charles there. Eileen there. I met all these people, and they're all just really cool. And then they you turn on the physics, and they're all just super brilliant. And I just, I love being around you guys. I love the work that we do. I love working with the young people that come through there. That's the, to me, it's the most fulfilling thing that I'll do all year long. And we do it every year, and I, I love, I love it. So and I keep doing it, and I'm gonna stop after this year because I'm tired. But um. Outside of work and academia, the NSVP stuff and the stuff that I do for Florida a and National Alumni Association is the most fun I have. I meet from FAMU, I mean, you meet everybody from Common to Anika Noni Rose and they all come to the alumni convention because it's like homecoming and it's, it's crazy. And I, I, it's a blast. We raise so much money we give money away to students and we give money to the university. It's, it's fantastic. That's, I'm I'm a boring person, so that's I don't get to meet any you know sultans or admirals and stuff like that unless they're FAMU graduates. And we have a few generals that are FAMU graduates, but they just they're just FAMU graduates until they whip out their you know stuff. You know, man, cause you a two star general, I have no idea. But um, that that's that's what I enjoy about about my life outside of academia. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna switch focus a little bit um, to talk about something very important. Um, it would be great to hear about uh, how you navigate conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion at your institutions. What does that look like for you? And that's a very general question, but so whatever that looks like for you, we'd love to hear about it. Um, Julianne, would you mind hopping in on that? Well, Charles, it's easy. I hope that the monitor is working because I'm chocolate. So no matter where I go, I'm usually entering a, entering a space that looks much like the fake background behind me. So because of that, I call it the chocolate chip effect. You can either try to minimize yourself and implode you know, implode into a little black hole and go away and never be seen from again or heard from, or you can just own it 
own all your chocolatey goodness, your tan, dulce de leche goodness, whatever it is, whatever flavor color you are, and just be real about it and uh, you know address whatever monkey or elephant is in the room at the time that it occurs. Because in my department, I am the only black physicist in my department and that's been a historical only. Uh, first, only all of that. And I think a lot of us have that designation unless you come from an HBCU like somebody over here, Mr. Steven over there, you know, it's a little different. You have a different background that most of us do not have or share. And what I'll say is that even without that, you can persist and succeed. I'm a service chief over two services. And I mean, I'm nobody expected me to come. I don't know if they really knew I was black when on my application. And the thing is being real about your expectations. I suggest lowering them. And this is hard, I believe, especially for zennials and millennials, because you expect to be treated a certain way. And if they don't do that, well, you know, it's, we're setting it off. No, I suggest before you accept or even apply to a program, get to look at the profile and the history of how many people who have your background have made it through. Get a firm understanding of what you're up against and be ready for that. Don't go someplace, not know their history and then be shell-shocked when they act a certain way. There are even departments that don't have women's bathroom on the same level. If you go to them, you have to, especially the old buildings, like in the 1950s buildings, women's bathroom may be three levels above you in order to get that in a science building. I've gone through that. And I want you to be honest and own your future. Find a department that has the kind of diversity where you can succeed. Many of us do not do this work. We just say, I like that project. Oh, quantum computing is great. I have no idea what these people are like, but I hope they accept me. I want you to understand it's a two way street. Understand them before you even apply. And then if you get accepted because there's so few places you can go, get a sense of how willing they are to learn to improve upon their history. And be real, where are the people of color in your, in your school? Where do I go if I have a problem? Because obviously like I see no a mentor here, no ally. Where should I go? And that's why I like being in a medical program because then there's other medical doctors, other departments where there's people of color, Latino backgrounds and other backgrounds, and even Ethiopians. We've got a, we've got a quite a few. Abe, you need to come on down to Houston, and you know not just the D.C. area. We got people. We've got people down here, and you can find your click. And once you identify that the place has that, then you go ahead and you sign that contract and stay. So what I've been able to do is connect myself to the physicians of color and the other faculty of color that are in allied fields, not necessarily my own, so that I would have my critical mass of support to allow me to persist and to succeed. And so you have these conversations, they're uncomfortable, but you better grow up because you know why? That PhD is waiting for you. So you have to own it. This is your history that you need to make. And it doesn't matter how many people have come before you. They're going to have to get used to you now. Learn their game and then show them that you aren't afraid. And every single day that something happens, be able to know based upon their code of ethics and their conduct what is supposed to happen should you encounter something. And keep a record. Make sure you have an email to follow up every conversation you have. I hate to say that, but that's the simplest thing that I learned as a grad student who um, faced certain things. You follow it up with an email. Very few people are gonna send it to you. You better follow up that conversation, that call with an email saying, "We, uh, as we agreed upon, oh, start signing legal. They hate that. And you will be able to cover yourself enough, not necessarily make a whole bunch of friends from that, let me be real, but you gotta know, am I the kind of person that can stand on her own or his own? And do I want this bad enough? So pick a field, listen to us, decide what is not for you and find something that you're willing to fight for because you will have to fight. <laughs> Incredible. Hope that Incredible. You. Thank you so much. You know, let me actually ask you a follow up question before I proceed to the other panelists. You've already told us uh, quite a lot about, um, I guess you've given us quite a bit of advice about finding organizations that are um, maybe not committed to DEI, but at least, you know, accepting of you and your identity. Um, so, one question I have for you is uh, during the interview process, for example, um, like, how do you go about sussing out the culture of, of an organization um, mm -hmm. to learn a bit about whether or not you really want to be there or if you would be, if you'd have the resources to, to thrive there? 
Charles, that is the greatest question. And now that I'm finally on the steering committee for our graduate acceptance program, I am so glad I can actually um, address this on both sides. You look at who they present to you as the interviewers. If the people who are around that table, because we do it well, you know, be pre-COVID or even now in the Zoom box, because we have to do it by Zoom most of the time now, you look, if they didn't even have a person of color or a woman, faculty member that they could rustle up to show you that, hey, we're diverse in 2020 or 2021, child run. If just don't pass go, don't stay. And they don't even have somebody who is Latino. Like you better run. Nowadays, everyone knows they find some allied faculty, a woman, someone, you know, that represents a different cultural background so that you get the sense that you will not be the only person of a different background than the majority. You've got to see that. So before they even ask a question, look at the screen and say, hmm, I don't see a big representation from women faculty here. What is the percentage of women faculty? I just want to know. I'm a woman. Or I, you know, actually, you know, I'm, I'm non-binary. What is the LGBTQ plus type activities that you guys sponsor and so forth? And should I be concerned? You need to know that this is safety. You need to know if you will feel threatened or if there has been issues. And I know a lot of times you just want everything to sound rosy and that you're so perfect for them and keep yielding. No, it's a two-way street. Five to seven years, it's going to be like a marriage. And if you've never been in a long-term relationship, there's a reason why there's divorce. I want you to understand before you sign any contract, you've got to know it's as good for them as it is for you. So make sure you, you nicely say, what, um, you know, what is the number of women faculty? There's no one on the panel that represents that. I just want to know, you know, and they should be able to answer pretty quickly. Oh, 25% of my faculty are women. Every woman's busy today. They should be able to address this and look through their website back, you know, check it. And also what I want you to be able to do is to really um, find the equity, diversity, and inclusion website for that particular institution. They should list what they are doing and what, they, um, what their stats are and so forth. And their graduate programs outside of diversity should show you what the actual graduation rate is by race and gender. If they don't have that, you don't know what their attrition rate is, meaning how many people actually make it to their PhD, run. They need to be able to tell you, say, hey, how many of your students actually graduate? You need to know if that's just a, a sweat house where they just knocking people out, making them work all day and no one's graduating, or you have a great path for success. So you got to do your homework. And grad school is the single most defining um, aspect of any scientist's life, regardless of your color, but it's uniquely more stressful for people who don't identify as the majority. So that goes if you're not heteronormative, if you're not a particular race, and that's not necessarily white always in certain programs. I want you to understand that. In STEM, white is not the only major group. I would, I would highly want you to understand that there's a lot of other races that will be highly represented that may not um, be really conducive to your welfare. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. But those are great things. Thank you, Charles, for bringing that up. Yeah, incredible. Thank you. Um, did, did anyone else want to chime in on that before I go back to the previous thing? Yeah. Uh, maybe I can add in a couple of points here. So your, your existence in a PhD program is in itself a huge achievement. Uh, there aren't as many of uh, as many of people who look like me in the PhD program that I did, and I'm sure everyone here can say the same. And so, look at it two ways. One way is how do you make things better for yourself, and the other is how do you make things better for others. Uh, there will be days when research will be hard. There will will be days when one of your experiments, something that you're doing will fail and you'll feel down. And it's at those times that you'll need a support system, a community, a mentor to tell you where to go from here, someone who you can lean on. And that's why it's very important for yourself to build a community. At the same time, uh, I would I would reiterate what what was said earlier about looking at the the equity diversity and inclusion efforts that the department is doing and making sure that they're also effective. It's very easy to do DNI work that's not effective and just have a web page and not achieve anything and it's your it's up to you to make a statement about 
what an effective DNI effort looks like specific to your department, your field, whatever it is. So think of it again, I'll, I'll just repeat what I said earlier, think of it in two ways. One is for yourself, your own being in a PhD program is a huge achievement and you should do everything you can to make sure that you get to the finish line. You should protect your own mental health. You should form a support system around you. Please do whatever you need to make that happen. And the other is make things easier for others by making sure that the environments around you, all the DNI efforts, anything around you is honest and effective in making life easier for others. Great, thank you. Uh, Stephen, did you want to add anything on that? No pressure uh, to so just I'm ask you. Because I had the questions that they sent earlier about navigating conversations because I've been out of school for a while. And as you, as Julie said, I went to HBCU. So having conversations about diversity, equity and inclusion are a little different at an HBCU than uh, in other places. But you, unfortunately I couldn't stay at an HBCU. I was in love and my wife wanted to move away from Tallahassee. So I had to leave an HBCU. And so you have to ask, so the question for me in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion are different. They're all work related. So, and I went to go work for the government. We theoretically is supposed to be, you know, of the people, by the people, for the people, blah, 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 blah. So there, um, and there are a lot of uh, black people that work inside of the government. However, when you start to ask how many scientists work for the government, it starts to change. It's been, you know, and it's not, you know, all of a sudden I'm flying the buttermilk again. And you have to start, you have, you have to figure out how you're going to navigate being the flying the buttermilk, the, impl the implosion, or are you going to be, you know, what's on, you know, greeting people with pounds and daps and stuff at work? Are you going to be that? Are you going to be that person? So first thing you got to do, you got to, you got to be the best at what you do. There's just, there's just no, there's just no way of getting around it because they're going to assume that you cannot do the work when you get to your job. It doesn't matter. You could have graduated from wherever. It doesn't matter. When you walk in the door, unless you are world famous, they're going to assume that you cannot do the work and whatever they give you to do, you will not be able to do it. And you just gotta, you just gotta knock them on their ass every time you get a chance. Every single time you get a chance, you just put them on their ass and be like, wow, Steven is like the best thing since sliced bread. I hope everybody from family is just like him and they're not. But, you know, and now when it comes to navigating conversations, because this whole equity, diversity, and inclusion thing is new, so to speak. Because um, everybody saw, you know, George Floyd and then I'll get all the emails about diversity. We love diversity. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, really? Well, when I look at the board of directors for this company, they're all white, all of them. Every single one of them is white. They're like three women out of like 20 people. How committed are you to diversity, equity and inclusion? Because as the leadership of an organization goes, the organization goes. And so if you have, you know, out of 20 people, 17 of them are white guys, you, you tell me what you think the company is going to do. So, and especially when they ask, this the bad part is that they ask. They say, well, Stephen, what do you think? And so I just say, well, who do you have on the board? Who's on the board? Who's the fellow? There are only black smart people that, are, you know, turn wrenches. There are no black smart people working here. I say, who, where do you go recruit for people? Do you go to Bayer? Do you go to NSB? Do you go to NSBP? Do you sponsor these people? Do you go to the, we live, I live in outside of Baltimore. Within a four hour drive, there are 10 HBCUs, 10. So do you go to, I mean, Morgan is 20 minutes away. Have you ever been down to Morgan to even give a talk, to recruit for people? Because when you, is there's what you say and there's what you do. There's on the web, there's what's on the website and then there's who's in the lab. I'm in the lab. That's it. So you can have whatever you want to on your website. We, we're going to have a book club and we're going to read The Warmth of Other Suns. Well, that's great. Who are you cutting big checks to, to be a scientist in your place? And if all we're doing is reading this book, I can read a book at home. Well, it'd be nice to have two of me or three of me 
And in SBP, we got like hundreds of us and you can't find two to work here? Give me a break. So I, tr I try not to be, you know, real amped at work because they're real nice and they pay well. But if you're going to ask what it, in diversity looks like, what it sounds like, what it should be like, it, you should not be coming from one point of view. A bunch of white guys should not be setting the agenda of what diversity looks like. And don't ask me all the questions. And you then you don't put me in a, in a position where I can have influence. Because if it was me, I'd say, you need to go to Bayer. It's in DC every year. You need a sponsor at Bayer every year. You need to go down to Howard. You need to go down to Virginia Union and Norfolk State and Hampton and, and Bowie State. All these places are within driving distance. And we don't go to any of these places. You can't tell me that you're interested in diversity. I don't believe you because what you are saying and what you are doing is different. So when you're in these organizations, you have to call out the leadership and say, we could do this. We could do this. We could do this. And when they don't do it, that tells me all I really need to know. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Abe, I wanted to get your perspective on this, about how you handle these diversity, equity, and inclusion conversations in the workplace. I mean, that could be Princeton, that could be IBM. And regarding IBM, in, uh, in particular, in light of the new IBM uh, HBCU Quantum Center, like uh, obviously IBM is taking some, you know, very strong, they, they've put a lot of uh, weight behind their words regarding diversity. So if you had anything to add about that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, this is, um, well, just just uh, five or so minutes ago, I was contemplating switching to medical physics because I just heard that it's it's easily, it's easily the most inclusive thing. And so maybe I need to consider switching. Uh, Unlike that picture where um, where there are plenty of Ethiopians, there are plenty of um, people of color and so on, quantum computing is very young and we don't we don't necessarily have um, the structure set in, in terms of what the field looks like. We have an opportunity to shape that today. And so I have colleagues, um, Kayla Lee, um, Benita Zasueta, who did a really good job of building out an IBM HBCU Quantum Center, um, which is a program that really tries to ensure that HBCUs are part of the process of this quantum computing workforce development that we're trying to do. As you're trying to shape the way a field looks from the get-go, from, get from the very beginning, it's very important to include all voices. And that's what we're trying to do with IBM Quantum um, HBCU Center. Um, I think Thomas Searles was in the comments somewhere or asked a question earlier. Um, he's also helping us throughout all of this. And I'd like to make a shout out there. Really, this work is making sure that um, quantum computing looks much more inclusive than other STEM fields uh, since we're shaping it. I'm still not convinced that I should stay in quantum computing, though medical physics is looking pretty solid right now. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, can, I, can I say something real quick? Please. Yes, please. Okay. Um, so I'm reading um, any advice about finding organizations that are committed to equity, diversity, and inclusion may not necessarily be where you are. So I guess I'm older than everybody on this panel. So I kind of remember when NSBP, all, all the black, because when I, I mean, I went to FAMU undergrad and I finished from FAMU PhD, but I went to Michigan State for two years. And those were some lonely times, fam. Let me tell you, it's just, it's just different. I was switching from mechanical engineering to physics. And so there's a gap in understanding. And I, they were just things I didn't know. And they're just looking at, you know, oh, he's such an idiot and he's black too, of course, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, organizations like NSBP to me were just vital to building a community of people who look like me, who could do similar work to what I was doing. Cause nobody did the, I, you know, even if I was medical physics, I probably would not be doing exactly what Julie is doing, probably. So it's important that you get a cohort of people that are in the ballpark of what you're doing. Whoever, if you say quantum computing to a physicist, we, our brains aren't going to leak out of our ears. You know, if you say it to, a, you know, my mom, she's what quantum out of her ears. This, that's just a fact. So it's important that even though you are not, you may not have the community where you are, it, you can find community 
in places online because you got to understand in 2003 and four when I was in school Facebook and social media and all that stuff that didn't exist so it was just you and Jesus and whoever decided to be your cohort now in 2020 you can just create a Twitter thing saying hey we're black in physics and we're gonna be together boom you have like a thousand people who are your friends and they'll talk you through anything and they're just your best friends now so even if you have to walk through the wilderness at work and you know hop online with you know NSVP or Black in Physics or African American Women in Physics or whoever will be on your side to say, hey, you're okay. Everything is going to be fine. Go back up into the wilderness tomorrow. Keep getting them. Do, do whatever you gotta do, get your money, whatever. And we'll be here to support you when you get off of work. So even if you're in a place where, you know, every, everybody hates me, nobody likes me, they think I'm an idiot. Everybody keeps telling me, make sure you have on laser goggles when you go in the lab. I'm like, are you fucking serious? Really? Stop telling me that. Please don't discuss anything classified out in public. Are you serious? Stop telling me that. So you can go, you can get off of work and go around some people who be like, you know, Stephen, you're not an idiot. And they're just, they're just whatever. We love you. We know you're brilliant. Go back in there and get your money. So don't don't be mad you know if you can't find cohorts where you are and you this is where you really need to be find some cohorts somewhere else that can help you charles can i add something to this very quickly please something that i wish i did in grad school um that i didn't have a chance to do earlier i talked about this idea of find your community in graduate school because there will be times when you will need a community around you something that stephen is saying that's very important here is that these things are available on social media. I didn't, I didn't take part in a lot of these things when I was in graduate school. I just had this impression of I need to put my head down, do my work, and then get out, and then I'll have all of these things once I graduate. It's very important to be meeting people, be forming your communities both online and in person. And that's a benefit that we have today. That's not something we should, we should ignore. Um, it's something I just wanted to add to this conversation. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we are out of time. Uh, panelists, thank you so much. This was an incredible conversation. I'm so happy that all of you joined us. Um, everybody, uh, this is our final professional event for the week. Thank you for everyone who's uh, joined us throughout the week. We have some incredible social events lined up. Uh, one, we have our all mixer. So this is uh, for everybody Black at all levels, in all fields, uh, all generations, please come and join us uh, for some community building. We also have another really excellent event for every person, for everybody. Uh, that is our virtual murder mystery, right? That's on Saturday. So join us for this. Um, okay, so that concludes this panel. Again, thanks to the panelists. Thanks to the people who uh, attended. And we'll see you in other uh, Black and Physics Week events. Um, panelists, if you could stay on while everybody else leaves, just for a minute, that'd be awesome. All right, bye everybody else. I'm just finish letting them head out. Uh, Vanessa, recording. can we stop the recording or can we stop the uh, the live stream? That's the captions. We probably should also stop the recording. I will in a second. Okay. Let's see, Jessica, okay. This is, I mean, this is fine. I, I just wanted to ask a quick question. So I don't think that we, I don't know if we had asked you already in the beginning, because I came in late. Um, but is everyone- few oh, no, attendees. Yeah. How do we stop the captions, Eileen? You would go to the, I think the, at the more. Oh, I, so I stopped the live stream. Yep, okay. the custom live streaming captions. Done. Just in the stream, cool. so y'all are good. Hey, can I be mo promoted? I want to say hello. Yeah, Vanessa, can you promote Jessica Esquivel to a uh, uh, panelist? What about Marika also? Uh, yeah, I, uh, Marika, you don't need to stay uh, if you don't want to. It looks like she doesn't want to stay. Okay. Can you see me? 
Hi. Yes. Oh, okay, Hi. actually, sorry. Can you promote Marika too? Yeah. Cool. So I just want. So again, I was late, and I don't know what was discussed before. I just wanted to get positive confirmation that you are all okay with us recording this event, and that we can post it on our site and stuff like that. Oh yeah, I asked before. Oh, you did. Cool. Okay, yeah. sorry, I wasn't here for that. I just wanted to make sure. Mm-hmm.